He doesn't get the answer he wants because he knows the two are not, the two oppose each other. He literally washes his hands from, from the issue and walks away. Because as far as Pontius Pilate's concerned, his truth is going to win out. We call that relativism nowadays. <clears throat> from Vatican II onwards, there have been so many encyclicals, apostolic exhortations talking about the tyranny, and even now I'm reading a book by Cardinal Seurat, The Tyranny of Relativism. And this is what we're faced. This is what brings us, this is what creates problems. Because the first thing relativism does, the main thing it does, it does away with absolutes. Well, one of the absolutes that exist is true. So you do away with all the absolutes. You do away with true. Father Joseph touched on that, right? We don't live in a world that believes in a biblical truth anymore. The problem with relativism, it leads to nihilism. Because when my truth is as valid as your truth, and his truth, and his truth, then we have no concept of truth. If we do away with the concept of truth, if we do away with things that are black is black and white is white, if we do away with that, and there's, well, you know, it's only compared to something else that it's really that it appears black, and it's only compared to something else that this appears white, or that this appears good, and that that appears bad, then what happens is we start <coughs> playing the devil's game, right? Then we're sinking closer and closer to nihilism. And that's where the devil dwells. The devil loves nihilism. Nihilism destroys, is the great, greatest ideology. It destroys everything else. Because nothing is worth fighting for. Nothing is worth standing up for. Nothing is worth defending. It's just another ideology, and it needs to go. Nihilism? Nihilism. Frederick Nietzsche is the biggest nihilist, uh, the most well-known, I should say. I think there's probably bigger, but he's the most well-known nihilist. Science. Non-ethical science, because we all pursue things. And of course, we live in the 21st century. We're Western people. We know every, our society is based on science nowadays. Its claim is, everything which is not forbidden is compulsory. Everything which is not forbidden, you must do. That's what drives science. There's no ethics, there's no good, there's no bad. And if you think that doesn't, that doesn't apply, just think, in two weeks, marijuana is going to be legal. It's illegal now, up until June 30th, July 1st. It's legal. All the families, all the people who have, especially teenagers in that, you think they are not going to be forced? They're not going to be going with the idea that, well, it's legal. I can do it. Basically, I have to do it. It's legal. If we don't know our faith, We'll think we're being good simply by following the laws of the land. In, uh, during Lent and during Advent, when the priests are, you know, got the big push to get people into the confessionals to prepare us for the big holy days, you know, you know, inevitably, if you talk to any priest, eventually you'll get someone who'll say, I had this guy, hasn't been to church, hasn't been to confession for 30 years, Shows up, he says, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been 30 years since my last confession. And he says, well, I'm not really that bad. You know, it's not like I'm Charles Manson. I'm not going around killing people. Okay, that's nice, right? So now you've just compared yourself to a serial killer. Good. So you're better than a serial killer. Now let's take it up a notch. Are you as good as God, as Jesus? Because that's our standard. Father Joseph was telling us, right? We shouldn't be going in the confessional or anywhere living our lives saying, well, you know, there's people worse than me, and, you know, so I'm not as bad as right, all those guys. No, but are we as good as Jesus wants us to be? A lot of times we fall short. And that thinking, that's not going to get us into heaven. John Paul II, 
says, this is a very old temptation of wishing to become like God through the use of a liberty without bounds. So in other words, everyone is free nowadays to do everything to everyone while asserting their own rights and respecting everyone else's rights. Well, I see the contradiction in that. Every time I assert my rights, it's going to be, sorry, the quote ended at bounds, right? The rest was my interpretation. So in other words, everyone is free to do everything to everyone while asserting their own rights and respecting everyone else's rights. There's a contradiction there. But that's what society wants. It just goes along saying, everyone has all these rights. Well, my right is going to infringe on somebody else's rights. It has to, especially if it opposes it. We can't all have different rights where we all get along. It's not going to happen. But we'll just gloss over that and pretend that there's not a contradiction there. Let's all celebrate everybody's rights. And actually, if it turns out that it impinges on any rights, then, as we just saw in the news yesterday, the day before, the Supreme Court once again came through some, some uh, decision to take away more religious freedom. And this is in Canada. Moral rights do not change. For example, all life is precious from conception to death. And I could think of about 10 other things. They're called commandments. They do not change. Man-made laws change. Pot laws, right? Up until June 30th, pot illegal. July 1st, legal. So we know those things change. We can't live our lives based on ethical principles and just on laws, man-made laws, when we know they're gonna change. The stakes are too high to play around with these philosophical ideas. We're in a spiritual battle for our souls, for the souls of our loved ones. So what can we do about it? One, realize we're in a spiritual battle. A lot of us don't even realize that. This is war. Are we acting like soldiers? Our, orient our moral compass. Why? Because apparently, it's not as steady as we claim it is. We head off and heading north, and next thing you know, we're going due south. This is because of the relentless garbage in, garbage out attitude that we live in in our society. We're bombarded everywhere. I call it the Seinfeld effect. I used to love watching Seinfeld back when it was on, you know. And what it is is basically the slow erosion of morals through relentless entertainment, TV, movies, music. It's this idea because we have to live in this world. So everywhere we turn, we're faced with the world and we get used to it. And every time we get used to it and we go, oh yeah, that was a funny episode where Elaine's looking for her contraception thing and she's gonna gather everything. Oh yeah, that was a good episode, right? The show got so bad that after 10 years, they actually had to tell us that these four characters were horrible. They had a judge say, there was a, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the last episode of Seinfeld, uh, there was a mugging. And these four, the four main characters, are standing around filming this big guy being mugged and making comments on it. And then they had passed the law in the States, and so they're brought up to the, to the judge. And he says, I can't think of anything worse than putting you four together in prison so you can all inflict your bitterness on each other. That's how bad it was. But we had to have Seinfeld tell us how bad those characters were because we loved them every week. So we must find out what truth is from a moral authority. Hint, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's where we need to look. Now that garbage in, garbage out, we can also have holiness in and holiness out. We need to change our lives so that we can, instead of being influenced by the garbage, we can be influenced by the holiness around us, which is what we're doing here today. So we're here in the world, in God's vineyard. And I'd like you to remember, keep in mind that image, because it'll come back. But we're also in the devil's playground. And I quote like, part of the St. Michael's prayer. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, 
cast into hell Satan and all evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. There's our battle. This is where we are. In our parish, we pray it at the end of every Mass. And somebody said to our new secretary, that's really scary. I don't know what scared her the most. I hope it was the fact that she was reminded that we're in a spiritual battle and that we need heavenly intervention and help to get us through this battle. So can we live with one foot in this world and one foot in heaven? Yes. Father Joseph pointed out the cross with Jesus right there. Right? We have the world and we have the vertical part leading right up to heaven and Jesus is there to meet us. If we want to be, because we are living members in the church and we are called to take an active part in her mission of salvation, we can make it so. What does God expect of us? Romans 8. Through the spirit of adoption, we are co-heirs with Jesus in his mission. In the mission, I'll remind you, we are given the ability and responsibility to accept the gospel in faith and to proclaim it in word and deed without hesitating to courageously identify and denounce evil. Here's our mission. But Jesus is going to help us. We're not going to do this alone. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We need Jesus. We need the church. So because we belong to Christ, Lord and King of the universe, we share in his kingly mission, and we are called by him to spread that kingdom in history. We exercise our kingship as Christians, above all in the spiritual combat in which we seek to overcome in ourselves the kingdom of sin. We master ourselves, and we can help our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones. We can change the world. So, we offer our work, prayers, and apostolic endeavors our ordinary, our single, married, family life, our daily labor, our mental and physical relaxation, and if they're carried out in the spirit, capital S spirit, including the hardships of life, if patiently born. This is from John Paul II. All of these become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. During the celebration of the Eucharist, every Mass, these sacrifices are most lovingly offered to the Father, along with the Lord's body. Thus, as worshipers whose every deed is holy, we, the lay faithful, we men, we consecrate the world itself to God. That's how his kingdom is going to be established on earth, and that's going to be our role. How do we accomplish our mission? We've been given tools. Jesus left us seven holy sacraments, and the Holy Spirit has given us his gifts, charisms, skills to be the best husband, the best individual, the best father, brother, friend that we can be. We must die to ourselves so that Jesus may live in us. The Holy Spirit cannot work with so much ego in the way. It's great to go to Mass every day if we can. It's great to take communion. We have to allow, we have to give some room to Jesus and the Holy Spirit to work through us. We have to go to confession. Sometimes we pray, Jesus, I trust in you, when we're praying the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. We, <clears throat> but do we really trust him? More often than not, no. We give him a quick one-hour Mass and... Father, better not make it make the homily too long, because otherwise we'll go somewhere else, or we'll certainly complain. We'll write a letter to the bishop. 
and maybe we'll give them one or two prayers. If we're really in a jam and we need some help, we'll pray to God. Right? But otherwise, we go about our own business. And that's a problem. How quickly we forget that we are sent into the world to prepare the coming of the kingdom of God. And when is that? At the end of every Mass. The Mass has ended. Go out and serve the Lord. Interpret that any way you want. It does not mean sit down and watch nine hours of football on Sunday. I, trust me, I've, I've done the math. It doesn't work. But I'm not a good mathematician. So. <laughs> We're not serving the Lord by watching TV. It's that simple. Or playing video games or whatever it is we're doing. John Paul II reminds us we are not allowed to remain idle. Everyone is called to grow continually in intimate union with Jesus Christ, in conformity to the Father's will, in devotion to others, in charity and justice. If we turn our lives over to God and do his will, we will change the world. And I can give you three quick examples. Joan of Arc, teenager, she's 14. 500 years later, we're still talking about Joan of Arc because she stood up for God. Mother Teresa changed the world. These are single people. These are individuals who have turned their lives over to God and said, do with me what you will. And he did. Mother Teresa showed how many billions of people, well, probably six at that time, what compassion looked like. You don't help six billion people. You help your neighbor. And when that neighbor has been helped, help another one. That's what it comes down to. John Paul II, Saint John Paul II, changed the course of history. He had the backing of the church, but when he went to Poland, he went there as a native Pole, and he spoke his heart and he stood up for the church. Those are only three individuals out of how many billions of people that have already come past us, right, through history, have come and gone. They're not the only three who've changed the world, but they're three pretty good examples. We've seen who the world wants us to be, a slave to addictions and to time wasters, and basically distractions from our mission. But who does Jesus say we are? Simply, we are children of God, a servant of others. And he didn't just say that. He proved it. He showed us up to his crucifixion and beyond. That's how much he believed that. The Baltimore Catechism. I don't know how many of you know of the Baltimore Catechism. You know our, our, our catechism, right? The one that I think John Paul II worked on, like pretty big. Back in the 50s, 60s, uh, one of the first questions of the Baltimore, and this, so this, this was used for generations. If you guys haven't read the Baltimore Catechism, it's question and answer about our faith. And um, it's very good. I would recommend finding it online. There's different versions of it. But one of the questions very, very early on in the Catechism is, uh, why did God make you? And I think every Catholic has to be able to answer that question. Every man in this room has to be able to answer that question. And the answer that the Catechism gave, and that these kids, from the time they were four years old until they died, remembered, which enters your being. God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world. And then that's not all. But then to be happy with him forever in heaven. That's, that's why God, that's why we're here. We're here to learn and to know about God. We're here to serve God 
And we're going to serve God by serving others. Other parts of that make up the mystical body of God, of Christ. God is the truth. He is the, the answer to relativism. He is the standard. And John tells us, God is love. It's not God is like love. God can sometimes be loving. God is love. He's the air we breathe. He's in our fiber, the fiber of every, every fiber of our being. So we have to celebrate our authentic Catholic masculinity. But we can't fall into stereotypes. We're not brutes. We can be loving, compassionate men when we see the homeless, people begging. If you see a pregnant teenager begging for money, your first thought might be, man, this is a scam. She's got to pull in like three grand a week. But this is God. You've just met God. And it's your decision. You can give money and say, you know, God bless you. Hope you use it well. And hopefully not for drugs, especially if you're really pregnant. You can help or you can walk away. That's your decision. But you've just met God. That was one instance. We meet God all the time. I, I'm a Vincentian, so I work at the food bank. Our parish has a food bank. And, you know, for the 1% of scammers that are out there, we'll take the 1% scammers if we can help 99%. We don't mind. That's fine. If they, if they want to come in to our church and basically beg for a bag of food and a food voucher, we'll give it to them because we know we're helping more than we're not. That's a decision. And those who can't, who eventually, we had one girl quit because she also worked part-time at the beer store. And she got sick and tired of giving out a bag of food in the morning and then going off to work at the beer store and then having the same clients go and buy their beer. Because her thinking was, if you can afford beer, then you can afford food. So that's something each of us have to deal with. Engrafted to the vine and brought to life, the branches are expected to bear fruit. We're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. John 15. Bearing fruit is an essential demand of life in Christ and life in the church. The person who does not bear fruit does not remain in communion. Each branch of mine that bears no fruit, he, my father, takes away, Jesus warns us. That's fine. You're not going to be giving five bucks, whatever, to every single person that's begging for money. You don't have to. But you better be helping someone somewhere. Then Jesus ends. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. So in our, involved in our ministry work, we're, you know, we go home and we're going, man, this should not be so hard. You know, an argument with this person wanting more food or more money. And you're going, man, we're just trying to help. Why is this? Right? Or else we're older, we're getting more aches and pains, ministry work is tougher, and we think, you know, can't keep doing this, and there's no reason why. But there is, because we're being pruned. And I don't know about you guys, I do some pruning around my house. I've got some rose bushes. I don't do a lot of gardening, but I like my rose bushes. And I think about this every single time I cut a branch off, right? I'm pruning those bushes to bear nice flowers. And the aches and pains that we feel, the hardships, the crosses that Father talked about, we're being pruned. It's good. It's good stuff. The entire mission of the church is concentrated and manifested in evangelization, John Paul II tells us. Throughout history, the church has made her way under the grace and the command of Jesus Christ. And the command is, go out into the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Each Christian's words and life must make this proclamation resound. You've got to be loud if it's going to resound. You're not going to be whispering this. 
going to have to be loud. The proclamation is, God loves you, Christ came for you, Christ is for you the way, the truth, and the life. There's another aspect of our mission. This is what we're called to do. This is how we're going to evangelize. These are the words, either by word or deed. We either have to live our lives to reflect this, or we have to say it and mean it. Mary addressed the servants at Cana. She says, do whatever he tells you. But to act in fidelity to God's will requires, one, capability for acting, two, developing that capability. So we need a well-formed conscience. We need to read our Bible. We need to read our catechism. We need to be quite in tune with our faith. Here's a challenge. Be as interested in your faith as you are about your favorite sports team or your TV show or actor. Are you willing to train for spiritual warfare with as much effort as you would for a sports thing, like a marathon or whatever they're running on the lakeshore today? Think of the hours, right? They're going to run a marathon. I cycle a marathon length, so 44 kilometers. And... It's exercise, it's good. We're called to relax and do things. But at the same time, that's not our mission. When we're doing that, we're slacking off, right, from what we're supposed to be doing. What does it mean to be a Catholic man? Well, if you don't know that answer, Maybe you should get a spiritual director so you can find out what charisms you have, you've been given, and how the church can use them. We must live in such a way as to lift up our girlfriend, our wife, hopefully one or the other, but you know, not together, <laughs> our family members, our friends. We should rejoice in living a Catholic life. We shouldn't hide our lights under a bushel because we're made to be examples through our life, through our deeds, through our words. Words are cheap. Actions mean. How do we live a Catholic life? We squeeze Jesus into every nook and cranny of our lives. If you want to know what that life looks like, read the Acts of the Apostles. Or reread them. We just finished them just recently, right? Uh, during Mass. Look at St. Paul and St. Peter. These guys are, are tireless. They're imprisoned. They're tortured. And every time they walk out, all happy that they've endured this for Christ. Evangelization can be easy. I mentioned I was a cyclist. I walked into a, um, a bookstore one day, and there it was. A John 316 water bottle. I take that water bottle and I've put that, I've had that on my bike for years. I meet a lot of people on bike trails. I don't have to say a word and I'm evangelizing. They can ask me what John 316 is. They can go home and look it up. That's fine. That's just one part, right? We can do this with no effort. Just as St. Thomas literally touched the wounded, resurrected Jesus, we too can touch the wounded body of Christ by reaching out to our family and our friends. And everyone's wounded. Everyone carries around scars, battle scars. The naked, the poor, the lonely, the sick, the incarcerated, because Jesus said, for whatever you did to one of these, you did it to me. Matthew 25. If I had a tattoo, that's what I would have. We've been given the Mass. The beautiful liturgy is the public form of worship for Catholics. So participate in the Mass. 
get spiritually involved because that's where you're going to feed your faith, both literally and, and spiritually. Add silence to your life so you can hear God speaking to you in the quiet, like Elijah did outside the cave. Didn't hear him in the music on the radio or on TV or in the movies, in the silence. In one Lent, didn't know what to do for Lent, I thought. And usually, I'm a writer, so I sit at home and I write, and um, usually have the radio on, it's usually pop music, and I thought, well, let's try this. So one Lent, no music, and it's very interesting. It was very, it, actually, the first thing it made me aware was how many of these um, earworms that I, I had and it's the soundtrack to your life. If you keep hearing it on the radio, these songs, they're going to keep playing. And you're not aware of them while there's all this other noise and hustle and bustle. Add silence to your life. <clears throat> really get into the liturgical seasons. Advent, Christmas, Lent, Easter. Find out, if you don't know already, why the colors are different. Why... The, the prayers are different for the for the office uh, for the hours of the for the office hours hours of the office right father office liturgy. Liturgy. liturgy why they're different right because they change along with each each of the liturgical seasons get to know your parish priest as a friend invite him over for a meal no offense father Priests generally cannot cook, and it's really a wonder that they survive from one Sunday to the next. If you can't fix them a meal, bring them something. You don't have to feed 40. Give them one meal. But I know, I, I work in a rectory, and I know our, our poor priest from the Philippines, he does not cook. First thing he said, introduce himself, my name's Father Cesar, I don't cook. <laughs> he says, I hope you cook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pray the rosary anywhere while in your car while walking while cycling whatever it is you're doing and I usually if I'm not biking I'm walking I'm either off to the church coming back from the church and I know going to the church and coming back that's a rosary that's the legion prayers I'm a, uh, an auxiliary in the legion of Mary and so there's a set of prayers to pray along with the rose, with the daily rosary. And so I know I've got more than enough time, and sometimes I can even work in a uh, chaplet of divine mercy before I get home. But if I'm on my bike, definitely it's meditation time, prayer time, which explains maybe why I ran over that turtle last year. Ooh, I was just, it was I was completely innocent. This person stopped.